us today for the worship service at Calvary Road Baptist Church. Our desire is to equip believers to become fully devoted followers of Christ. Calvary Road has a dynamic ministry committed to worshiping God, loving others, serving others, and inviting others. Well, good evening, Calvary Road family. Have you had a wonderful Wednesday today? Amen. Have you had time or have you taken the time to tell our Lord today that you love Him? Have you had some quiet time with Him today? Have you experienced an encounter, a personal presence of, of His Holy Spirit with you today? I hope so. Um, he's the Savior of love. God is love. And He wants us to love Him and to love each other. Where would we be without the love of Christ? Well, we're going to sing an old gospel song, a hymn, Love Lifted Me. Is that your testimony? God's love has lifted us? A I say amen, one? Okay, thank you. Let's stand together and sing Love Lifted Me. I was sinking deep in sin, far from the peaceful shore, very deeply stained within, sinking to rise no more. But the master of the sea heard my despairing cry, from the waters lifted me, now say. Take your Bibles out if you would, and we're going to be in the book of Proverbs. And if you will, just turn to Proverbs chapter 1. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and back up and hit what our lesson would have been last week. If you don't have a, a book, Jerry's got them back there on the back table. Go get one of those if you want to. If not, just grab your Bible. We'll stay with it. 
And uh, we didn't want to waste the books that had been ordered uh, prior to all of this. And uh, pray for us as we pray about the direction we'll head uh, when we do ever get to meet back. We're not so sure right now we're going to stay with the same old system. And uh, just be in prayer about what God would have us to do. Uh, Mark and I have been talking at length about uh, what that might look like in the days ahead. Uh, there's a lot of subjects, and sometimes just I like to get with a book of the Bible and stay with it instead of jumping so many verses. It's hard to teach when you've got to jump 38 verses sometimes, and you leave a lot of meat out. So uh, we're praying about, we're, we may be offering different classes that you can take, and uh, an Old Testament study, a New Testament study. Uh, uh, I just got, a, we've got all kind of ideas. All right, look around you real quick and see who you're sitting around. And if you get sick, you call and tell us who it was was sitting near you. Uh, we just have to do that so we can let you know. All right, so if the person next to you makes you sick, go ahead and move to another seat if you want to. <laughs> Thank you, God. God bless you for being honest. Got it, got it. Appreciate that honesty. Just found out on, but right before I came up here that Nick Saban has COVID. Uh, and his athletic director, and uh, there's several of the colleges it's broke out in all of a sudden in the SEC schools. and So uh, here we go. Of course, he would say he had COVID right before Alabama, or Georgia comes to town. Ain't that right? No, I'm kidding. He really does have it. And... Uh, Tonight, before we get started, you know, it's been a crazy time, and we're hearing more and more of it, I think, as people are getting out, just like these coaches, and um, I heard today that Ole Miss had it, so I wondered if uh, Alabama, they just played this weekend, um, a lot of it at the University of Florida and their football team, and just a ton of it spreading right now, and let's just be real tonight, guys. Uh, a lot of people are going to get sick with it. We just have to come to terms with that. It's, it's going to get a lot of people. And some of us might be in that number and uh, just need to trust God to get us through it all. Um, it's hard to stop something you can't see and you have no idea. Uh, we, ha we never have any idea who we've been around and they may not even know they have it. That's the thing about it. But we do the best we can. And that's, that's all we can do, is just do the best we can. And uh, so it's good to see you. The good thing about this building is, is you can spread out as far as you want to in here, especially on Wednesday nights, and do that. If you're more comfortable in a mask, and I'd recommend that you wear that mask, and uh, you do what you need to do, and nobody's going to say a word to you. We're going to talk tonight about wisdom. Um, I would have been better served to have let Mark teach this. Who has, uh, who, you don't have to raise your hands, but Mark and I through this entire COVID experience have done a Bible study every Tuesday and Thursday with the exception of a few weeks where we had uh, a little bit of schedule conflicts and, and vacations, but it's called Moments with the Master. It's online every week, Tuesday morning Tuesday, and Thursdays at 1130. And... Uh, Several of you I know have been watching that. Um, we've been teaching through the book of Acts. Uh, and it'll come on every single Tuesday and Thursday. Now sometimes we come in and pre-record those. So you'll see us wearing the same shirt. I don't I want any response back to that. We used to bring a couple of shirts with us. And we just got tired of that. And uh, we sit here in two chairs and teach the scripture together much like we study together down at the office. And uh, so next Wednesday night, that we're, going to, we're going to do the lesson in here the same way. Um, the two of us are going to set up here, and you get to find out if we have any knowledge uh, among the two of us whatsoever. I love to throw a deep question at Mark. He had no idea was coming. And uh, to see if Mark has any wisdom at all. Uh, and uh, so let's see what the Bible says tonight in the book of Proverbs about wisdom. 
the book of Proverbs about wisdom. Proverbs chapter 1. You know, King David, uh, after he died, Solomon, of course, his son ruled, and he ruled for 40 years. What is Solomon most well known for? His money, his wisdom. What else? Women. His wives, his girlfriends, his stupidity. He was the wisest, most foolish person. And yet in the end of his days, he would uh, pin down a lot of things he had learned. I always have said that God, uh, we, we need to take in what older people say because they've lived it. If an older person tells you, I would not hold that that way, don't hold it that way. They probably broke their nose doing that. If they tell you that it's not wise to do that, they've learned that by experience. That's what Solomon uh, wants to get across. And, of course, like I said, these courtlies are, they can't add all of it or the books would be so thick, but they take us right straight into verse 7. Proverbs chapter 1 will be in verse 7. Look at it real quick. The fear of the Lord. I'm going to breeze through. This is your first lesson, which we would have done last week, but the, the massive COVID outbreak that we had here in the church prevented that. Uh, and so we weren't able to be together. Uh, by the way, guys, if you don't know, call us. Please call us and ask us. Don't make up anything. Um, the community will do that for you. Best thing to do, if you'll call me or Mark, we are fine with that. You call and ask us what is going on. And uh, we'll give you every bit of the information that we can. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. How many of you would love for that to be taught at Congress tomorrow? Amen. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. As a matter of fact, I'd want to say that if I was to stand there, the reason you have no knowledge is because you don't fear the Lord. The reason we can't figure anything out is because we won't listen to what God has to say. The true source of knowledge comes into clear view as we look into the wisdom of God's Word. It's what I love about this book. It is absolutely full of wisdom. You probably have in big blue letters, wise believers see things God's way so they can do things His way. Everything you and I do ought to be birthed out of this thought. Is it what God wants? What does God say about that? How should I operate my business? How should I experience this? How should I do my taxes? How should I love my wife? How should I react to my husband? How should we raise our children? It's all in here. Every bit of it is in this book. God laid it out, and he didn't hide mistakes. Why didn't God? He, he, he left us the mistakes laid out in clear view. We just looked at that with Samson a couple of weeks ago. God laid the mistakes out there plainly for us to see so we could learn from it, so that we could gain wisdom. If we'll see things God's way, then we can do things God's way. And, and he said it's the fear of the Lord. That's the beginning point. That's the starting point. It's a relationship with the Lord. It's very difficult to see things God's way if you don't have Him in you. And, and there'll be a rejection of His way if you don't know Him. And the fact of the matter is, is where we really get the wisdom starting point is the day we give our hearts to Christ. Some people believe that life experiences cultivate wisdom. I'll ask you this, is that true? Life experience cultivates wisdom. Oh, I agree. I say that's partly true. And, and our lesson writer said this, but without God's help, those experiences can lead you to draw conclusions that are not correct. So with God, you will learn. You'll start seeing it God's way. So you and I, as we walk with the Lord, the life experiences we're going through give us wisdom. That's why I say around here, we're learning this 
I say this, we're learning as we grow, not go, but as we grow. As we grow in the Lord, we're learning, which means we're going to make some mistakes. We're going to fall and bump our knee and bump our head. We're going to get hurt a few times. And then if wisdom says, talk to God about what, what did I do wrong right there? The Holy Spirit will never lead you wrong. And the Spirit of God will say, here's what you did wrong. Here's how to correct that. I've not been right many times in pastoring. But the times I've been right was only because God was clearly showing me that. The times I've been wrong was when John cut off God's voice and I did what I wanted to do. It was something may not have been bad, may not have been bad, but wisdom says that you can be sincere and be wrong and you'll just turn out being sincerely wrong. So experiences, they do teach us some wisdom, but the fact of the matter is, is it can lead you to draw conclusions that are not wise. Now, other people would say that age brings wisdom. Okay, how many of you know? Uh, how many of you know somebody that's dumb and old? <laughs> Anybody? Uh, if if you don't, uh, just go home tonight and watch the news for ten seconds. It don't matter how old they get; doesn't mean they're any wiser. Again. It's the fear of the Lord. It begins with God. If you don't know God, you can be 90 years old and still not have learned very much. And the fact of the matter is, wisdom may come with age, but only if those years have been spent drawing from God, drawing from the knowledge of who He is and how He wants us to live and how He wants us to walk our way through this life. Life experiences or long life does not guarantee wisdom, okay? You can go through a lot of experiences and still not make good choices. You can also get older and still not make good choices. Wisdom comes from the Lord. Look at the verse, verse 7. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge, but fools despise wisdom and instruction. Isn't that good? Solomon directs the people to understand that a productive relationship with the Lord is characterized by the word in the verse is fear. Now, this doesn't mean that God terrorizes us. It doesn't mean that we need to dread the, the presence of God. We ought to be welcoming to the presence of God, excited about the presence of God. Uh, what it means is we respect God. And we respect God to the point that we don't want to get out of the bounds because we don't want to be under the heavy hand of God. I've learned something in the last few days. I read a very great article on this. I believe two things are going on. I believe one thing's going on now that could lead to the next thing. But the question is this, are we under the judgment of God right now? Is this what we're going through, the judgment of God? And it, de it depends on... I really believe this. It depends on how you look at that judgment. There is the permissiveness of God. So it might be that God said, I'm going to permit COVID. It's evident he has. He could stop it right now. I'm going to permit COVID to go worldwide. See, this is not just an American pandemic. We got to remember every country is dealing with this. The fact of the matter is, is that it's, it is something God has set back and said, I'm going to permit this to happen. And here's the thing. In his permissiveness, wisdom says, what do we do then? And the Bible says, God said, if you'll turn to me during this, if you'll fear, respect, honor me during this, if you'll run to me during this, I can heal your land. I can, I, can, I can do some things through this. But what happens is if we do not react correctly to the permissive act of God that is going on, then God gets proactive. And God says, since you did not return to me, 
But you went running on, chasing your own things, doing your own thing. You ignored me. You had a chance to run to me. And I think about our country right now. We have chances. We've got choices. We can be running to God or we can be retreating from God or ignoring God altogether. If we do that, I really believe God has shot an arrow in as a warning shot. And God, just like he did Sodom and Gomorrah, he warned Sodom and Gomorrah. If you'll read back, they had a war and Abraham had to go in and deliver a lot of them. He took his mighty men and, and they were delivered. It was a warning shot. You are weak and you are in trouble. But they paid no attention to that warning shot. Then God got proactive, right? And God said, I'm coming and I'm going to destroy the city. Now here's the deal. God has warned and God has warned and God has warned. And it's right now to me as if the rug is a church. And God's taken that rug and he has shaken the rug. And he wants to see what his church is going to do and react and how it will react to all of this. And you know how we're reacting? We got people that are wanting to choke a life out of other people. And, and we got, we're being warned and people are getting upset about the most trivial little things. Guys, we're all going through this. We can all get sick in this. We have no idea when this will end. But I'm going to tell you this. We run to God during this time. We run to him for wisdom. God, how should I act in these, day, these days? We fear him and understand, God, you are so awesome and so mighty. You could take this away instantaneously, but if you are leaving this on us, and you, you definitely have a purpose in everything you do, then we accept it as yours, and we want to learn from it. See, I want us to be a better church on the other end of this. I want us to be more God-fearing and more spirit-filled on the other end of this. We may not be as building filled, but may we be as more spirit filled. Amen. So we may not have everybody in every seat, but the most invited guest should be the one we come here to see. And that is the king of glory. So the fear of the Lord, that's where knowledge starts. But foolishness says, I pay that no attention. See, fools have no use for God. They don't cherish wisdom. Verse 8. Listen to the writer. My son, hear the instruction of thy father and forsake not the law of thy mother. Pretty much self-explanatory. Listen to me. If you're going to rule well, if Solomon says my son, meaning that he's writing to his own son, and we don't know if he is, uh, you also could apply this that he is writing to young men in general. Okay? But as we read this, there's no... It's good to look at it from either vantage point as a father talking to his son, but it's also as an older man talking to mankind. It will learn either way. And if we're going to do things well, guys, we've got to do it from God's wisdom. How many of you are finding that God's wisdom usually goes contradictory to the world? It's opposite. The whole Sermon on the Mount is opposite of what the world teaches. You need to be poor in spirit. And the world says, no way. Uh, you know, you, you need to understand the world says you are good. The Bible says there's no good in you until you get saved and only he is good. Your righteousness, all the good you can do is his filthy rags. That's what the Bible teaches us about ourselves, which tells me that the Teaching of self-esteem came out of hell. Self-esteem teaches you need to have great self-esteem. You need to feel good about yourself. When I read the Bible about what we really are, there is nothing there good to feel about. We're sinners. The only thing that can make us feel good is when we know the blood's been applied. John is nothing, but Christ in me is everything. The only thing that makes me worth anything is the blood of Jesus Christ. Be careful with this psychological teaching that tells you you're something. Let me tell you, what we are is we have been blessed by the mercy and the grace of Almighty God. So we need to hear the instructions of the Father. Because I don't have it within me. You know, hearing sometimes, what does that mean? My son, hear the instruction. Hear it. Hearing can sometimes involve little more than waiting for our turn to talk. 
How many of us find that we're always talking to God, but we're very little letting Him talk back to us? Hearing means to pay attention. How many of you heard that growing up? Pay attention. You better listen. Absorb it. Apply it. I like that. Def. Apply what's being said. If you've truly heard me, the Father would say, you'll do what I told you. It's kind of interesting to me as I get older how much I hear Daddy more. And I hear something he would say, watch this. Dad was an electrician. I know very little about electricity. But I learned this, green is ground like the world is round. Daddy said, you better learn the ground. And I said, well, how did you figure that out? He said, because I nearly fried myself. Several times I've been shocked. Now, one thing he taught me is always go turn the power off before you touch it. A lot of wisdom there. So what you need to do is absorb that. Now, I illustrate it this way. If you will not absorb that, you're going to get burned. If we won't listen, we will get bit. Solomon urges his son to listen to his instruction. The worst decision his son could make, the writer says, as a young person would be to ignore or neglect it. The worst decision you and I can make is to ignore the Word of God or to neglect the Word of God. Let's absorb it. There's a great deal of wisdom. Verse 9. They shall be an ornament of grace under thy head and chains about thy neck. We have a hard time understanding the ornament of grace. Um, in Israel, especially in the days of Solomon, um, you would know if you saw somebody with something placed around their head, it would signify they had accomplished something. Uh, uh, we think of the Olympics when they put the medal around their neck like a chain around the neck. That means they've won a race. They've won a battle. They've beat a lot of people out. And, and that's what he's trying to say. Wisdom in your life. If you listen to the instructions, it'll be like an ornament around your head, a chain around your neck. You've won something. What do we win? We're, we're going to see that. I want you to, I wrote down in my book here, it truly pleases God when we apply His wisdom to our daily living. When God says, it is wise for you to do this, and then we do it. It is wise for you to forgive others. And we do it. There's wisdom in that, the Bible says. And when we do it, we're blessed because of it. These chains would signify honor. Pharaoh placed a gold pendant around Joseph's neck. Belshazzar Remember, put a pendant around Daniel's neck for the same reason. It would signify they had won something. So these questions make us think. There's questions throughout your lesson. I don't have time tonight to really go through them because I'm going to try to cover all of this. But what would you say? How have you experienced God's grace by seeking His wisdom? And, and think about that as, as we go along. Verse 10 through 12 my son, if sinners entice thee, consent thou not. If they say, come with us, let's lay wait for blood, let's lurk privately for the innocent without cause. Let us swallow them up alive as the grave and whole as that go down into the pit. He asked him, I beg of you, son, watch who you hang around. Verse 10, if sinners entice thee, you better be careful who you link up with in this world. That's what the teaching here is. Be careful who it is you listen to. Because some people are miserable and misery loves company. Nobody wants to go into sin alone. Okay, let's get that. Sinners want people with them. Then they don't feel as bad. Before they go do that. I was listening to a message the other day and here. I, I had to get out of my car, walk straight into my office, and I wrote it on the whiteboard. And here it was. He's teaching, and he was talking about how those things in our life we're always trying to make sound better, but we know we ought not be doing it. Here's what we wind up doing. We're always trying to defend it. 
We're always saying, well, I, it's all right. Here's the we rationalize it. So wisdom says, be careful who entices you in. They'll rationalize it. But here's what I, here's what I learned. Here's what I wrote down. Whatever you're always defending is what you're a slave to. Man, I had to just, I had to go write that down because I've thought about over life how many times we have said, well, I, I don't really see it as that bad. I mean, it's not that big a deal. What we've done is we've compromised, we give in. Here's what we wind up doing. We defend it, defend it, defend it. We can write a thesis, our defense. That's what the Internet is, guys. It's, it's a bunch of people defending their point of view. And no matter what point of view you pick tonight, I guarantee you Google it and you'll find somebody that agrees with you. There's somebody out there, I don't care how wrong it is, they will agree with you. Or if you're, if, if you're right, they'll also agree with you. There'll be people who say, I see it that way. And guess what? Guess what? Be careful who we're listening to. Because they'll lead us in the wrong way. There's a group of bad influencers, Solomon said. Who is influencing your life the most? What influences your life the most? Let's be careful with that. I pray. Listen, and I mean this across the board. I don't care what news outlet it is. We need to be careful what we're listening to. We just need to line it up with God's word. We need to say, is that truth from God's word or not? And I know there are some that give us more truth than other outlets out there give truth. But there are also a world of bad influencers out there. And we need to be careful. So that's what he's talking about. And then he goes on to say down in verse 11, if they say come with us and let's lay wait for blood. Solomon is really describing it in vivid detail. Be, be acquainted that the, this ambushing someone has a devilish charm to it. Uh, and, and here's what I underlined in the lesson. <laughs> what it basically means is, is there's an easier way to go about it, the bad influencers say. We can go out and rob somebody. We can lay and wait. We'll take it. Let's take the easy road. Let me put it in 2020 lingo. Let's not work. Let's just get it another way. And we have to be careful about that. Wisdom says... You don't work, you don't eat. Wisdom says the man, the Bible says the man that won't provide for his family is worse than an infidel. The man that won't work, who is lazy, who sits at home, it's never been biblical. Wisdom says you do everything you can to provide, to be a provider, to work. And that's what Solomon is, is going to get into. But, but what he's saying, there's going to be some out there that have this charm to it. And they're going to come. Look in verse 13. For we shall find all precious substances. We shall fill our houses with spoil. That's what he's saying. Let's make this easy. They would say that murdering an innocent person would be a way to gain wealth. We say, that can't, how in the world could Solomon think that could ever happen? Do you know how many people have been snuffed out in life for gain? <laughs> I wanted to say, ask the Clintons, but I, I didn't. I didn't say it. Uh, let's go on down in the lesson. Uh, the precious substance they would accumulate without having to work for it. And they don't want to wait for it. Let me tell you, Solomon talking to his son. If we want to apply it to the child, Solomon saying to his child, sometimes you've got to wait for it. You've got to work hard. And then it comes. You don't go out and devise a plan to, to get all you can and, and not have to do anything for it. That's the, the bulk of the wisdom he's trying to give him. Boy, do we need to hear that. We've got a generation that graduates high school and they want it right now. Right now. And what did we do? Is we've murdered a ton of our marriages in debt. We murdered the family in the process. Families got started out in so much debt they can't dig their way out. And, and, and let me tell you, you know, you've got to be careful how we're getting that. Verse 14, cast in thy lot among us. Let us all have one purse, they say. So there's bad companions all throughout the book of Proverbs. I think that's in your lesson. It's in a box here in my, my study book. But those who entice you to sin, that's a bad companion. Those who are fools, 
those who are gossips are a bad companion. Those who drink too much and are gluttons is a bad companion and who are rebellious, people that are rebellious. So the book of Proverbs lays those out for us. There are some people we just need to be careful we don't hang around. All right, that was the bulk of what I would have wanted to teach in lesson one. Now turn to lesson two, direction offered. And that will be our lesson that we would have studied tonight. I want to breeze through it as well. This takes us over into my favorite chapter. One of my favorite chapters is Proverbs 3. And we would cover 1 and 2, but I'm going to jump right in over here in chapter 3. Verse 1. My son, here we go again. Forget not my law, but let thy heart keep my commandments. Solomon didn't intend for his son just to memorize words. Solomon wanted them to be embedded in his heart. It just comes a way of living. Guys, we, we've got to get this. We don't need to just memorize words. They need to get in our heart. It becomes a part of us. We're going to talk in a minute about what it becomes is, is our character, our integrity. There's a lot of people can quote Bible verses but can't live it at all. There's a lot of people that sit in church for years who, who could probably tell you that the truth about what the Bible says, but their integrity is completely opposite. Their character says something different. Uh, the illustrator here of the, of the lesson said it's like a GPS. You can plug in the coordinates of a GPS and it'll tell you turn by turn how to get there. But instead, you decide on the journey, I'm just going to, I'm going to take my own road, road here. So you, you make a turn on your own. You know what that GPS is going to do in your car? It's going to say rerouting, rerouting. Make a U-turn. At the nearest location, make a U-turn. That's what it's going to tell you. How many of you have ever chewed out a GPS? I mean, yelled at. You think she hears you. I mean, I've done it. I've said, I know what you're saying. Which road? And then it'll say, make a slight left turn. It drives you crazy, don't it? And, and you think about it, but in our life, God's very clear in the directions. And here's what we plug into our heart. We plug the word into our heart. Thy word have I hid in my heart that I might not sin against you. That, that's what we plug in. And some of what we've plugged in, y'all don't get mad at me for this, but we've plugged in what Papa said. And it's not in the Bible. It's not there. It was just a good porch saying. And some of us have taken some things as if it was Scripture. That, you know, you used to hear, uh, now listen, there's, it's stupidity is what we've been taught. I know in the deep south a lot of dumb things were taught. God, the, the reason there's prejudice is God had rejected black people. He, it's a curse. And they'll go back in the Bible and say he cursed them with that skin color. You know, and then you start falling in love with God and you start walking deeper with God and you say, wait a minute. God loves all people. He died for all people. And we start saying, is this God's word? Is, where does instruction come from? So if it's God's law, we need to embed it into our hearts. And we need to let that flesh out in us. And hey, by the way, that's not always easy. That's not always easy. Did you know this? I learned this Sunday listening to a, uh, a message a Sunday morning. It wasn't me either. I didn't listen to Mark or me Sunday. Uh, but this is one I'd learned. I was listening and said, did you know nowhere in Scripture are you given permission for vengeance? Y'all stay with me just a second. Watch this. You know what one of the biggest tools for vengeance is? Social media. And nowhere is the child of God given the clearance by God to unleash on anybody else. 
Vengeance is mine, saith the Lord. That hurt. That stung. We think. Yet you've never, have you ever bargained with God? God, I call it this, give me a mulligan. God, one time. I know what your word says, but let me unleash right here. So if we embed them in our hearts, what does it do for our life? Verse 2 of chapter 3. Length of days and long life and peace shall they add to you. It's very interesting studying this out. Does this mean that the people who get old all live by the word? I was thinking, whoever, whoever got to live a long life, does that mean that they followed the instructions? They embedded it in their heart? Well, there's no way. There's no way. I mean, we know some dirty politicians that's pretty old, right? We know some people in the world who've told a lot of lies. We know, we know a lot of people that reached ripe old ages, and, and they, they lived very sinful lives. So that's not what it means, that, that they all live strength of days. Watch what it says. Length of days cannot be constructed to mean that people who don't live very long have disobeyed the Lord either. So you see a younger person that dies with cancer or something, and you say, well, the Bible, I guess the Bible makes it clear they must have disobeyed the Lord. They didn't follow the instructions. No, that's not what it means either. We can't say that. It suggests... I like this. It is a suggestion that our days, the whatever days we have, following God's instruction can be filled to the brim with matters, with what matters most in life. However many days you've been given. So you can't say it's length of days because we know people who have lived older lives and never ever came to the knowledge of Christ and they lived wicked lives. And it can't be length of days means that, that you everybody who does this lives long and stays healthy. That's the health, wealth, prosperity teaching. There are people who truly love Jesus who died early, uh, had an illness that took their life. But what it does mean is if you'll embed God's Word in your life for whatever amount of days you have, those days will be filled to the brim. Good days. He uses a word in that verse too. It's key. The word is peace. Days filled with peace. Did you see that? Let me tell you, that's a prosperous life right there. So I wrote in my notes right here as I studied, do you have that peace? I don't care what age you are. You have that, do you have that peace? I love hearing Paul in his writings say, I've learned to be content. You hear him saying, I just have peace. I don't have to have much. I've had much. I've had little. But I've learned to be content. I'm just walking with the Lord and loving every second of it. And sometimes I've got my back to a prison wall. And sometimes I get to baptize somebody or watch a whole family come to know Christ. Sometimes I've been in a prison and I didn't think I'd ever get out. But I had peace. And sometimes I've seen God shake the prison till the doors came open. And I saw a jailer and his whole family get saved. See, the, the life God gives us, I couldn't help but think of a verse in Isaiah that you will keep in perfect peace those whose minds are steadfast because they trust in you. Perfect peace. Y'all ever do this? Do you ever get to thinking about dying? And does it give you any anxiousness? Sometimes I do. I'll just be honest with you. I'm not worried about where I'm going. It's just the boat ride getting there. Y'all know what I mean? I know I'm going to be in heaven. Sometimes I think, well, it might just be best for me if I was to have to have a major operation if while I'm out, God just took me. You know? I know it sounds crazy to have those kind of thoughts. I think we all stop and think. But I'll tell you, when we take that kind of anxiousness to the Lord... He gives us peace. When we, we, if we keep our minds steadfast on Him, He starts giving us instructions. And so I say, let's embed God's law in our heart to have, and I hate to even quote this, but it's true, 
If you really want to have the best life on this sinful earth that you can possibly have, it is letting God live throughout your life. Letting God's word permeate your life. Verse 3 and 4. Let not mercy and truth forsake thee. Bind them about thy neck. Write them upon the table of your heart. So you shall find favor and good understanding in the sight of God and man. Proverbs 3 verse 3 and 4. We're loyal to God because we love him. And we express our loyal love to him by the way we love others. Man. See, if we'll put this stuff to work in our lives, we grow, watch this, we grow to become people of integrity. The lesson writer put it this way, to live with integrity means to be the same person inside and outside. And a life of integrity produces favor. A lot of people want God to bless their lives. They just don't want to live a godly life. It don't work that way. God will put favor on a life that is living that life with integrity by his word. Let, and, let mercy and truth, let not mercy and truth forsake you. Live a life of mercy, showing love to others. Live a life of truth, having integrity. Be real. Be biblical. Cultivate a good name that's worthy of respect. Well, this is good instruction for a boy, good instruction for a child. It's good instruction for each one of us. Solomon's writing, my son, don't forget it. Let it, let it get in your heart and then, then let it live out in your life. Be real. Be a person. Here's the deal. God sees what's inside and outside. And too many of us, I think, sometimes think that we can live an outside life when the inside's different. But God will not favor that life. If we look and say, why did God bless Spurgeon or Moody? Why did God bless Adrian Rogers? Why has God's favor been on their life? I bet you if we followed them around, they were people of integrity. What you saw was who they were. People around us cannot see into our hearts, but they can listen to our words and they can watch our actions. And what we got to do is let the Word of God embed in our hearts, get in our hearts, and then flesh out in our lives. So the more I take in God's Word, the more God's Word will take over me. The more I put in, the more it's going to come out. If you put garbage in, garbage will come out. If you put truth in, truth will start to flesh out. When you put Bible in and you start taking God's word at God's word, it'll start coming out in your life. And you'll find yourselves doing things more truthful, more honest. Not saying that we're all crooks and liars, but in God's eyes, you know, when you shade a little bit here and you shade a little bit there, people on the outside can't see that. And, and I don't mean getting anybody's business, but this is just, he's going to say it here in a minute. That's the same in our giving. It's the same as in everything that we do. God knows whether we're shading or not. I sat down with my accountant a couple of years ago. My accountant uh, asked for my tithes and, and offerings sheet, and I gave it to him. And he looked at it, and he looked at the numbers. And I'm not saying this to brag on me. I give praise to the Lord. But he said, it's refreshing to see a preacher who actually tithes. And I said, are you saying what I think you're saying? I remember he said it, it, it's not as common as you might think. Boy, that got quiet, didn't it? My favorite two verses, verse 5 and 6. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Lean not unto thine own understanding. In all thy ways acknowledge him and he'll direct your paths. The word trust, it's huge. Lean completely on him. You trust him just like you trusted sitting down in that seat was going to hold you up. Acknowledge him involves walking with him. It means he's important to you. 
It means you acknowledge that he knows better than you. It's the GPS that if it says turn right, you do it. Because it's directing your path. Trying to find our own way through this crooked place we live in can be difficult. However, God's wisdom, trusting Him, acknowledging Him in God's wisdom, this is what He'll do. He will direct your path. But I think that's neat. He, I heard one preacher say, if you are truly trusting God and acknowledging God in your life, you can't go left if you're supposed to go right. Because God is going to turn you right. He's going to show you the right way to go. He, just acknowledge Him. Place that in your life. And then verse 7 and 8. Be not wise in your own eyes. Selfish pride. That's what that means. Don't, don't have selfish pride. Fear the Lord and depart from evil. You know, the problem with success is it can make you arrogant. It can persuade us to think that we are wise. I think if we all got honest, we would say that if anything good happened, it was God that done it. Humility has is, is, is got to be a part of our life. Walking with the Lord in humility. According to Solomon... If we walk with the Lord in humility and we have integrity in our life, we will have a full life. We will have an abundant life. We will have peace in our life. And if we'll walk with, a, with integrity and do it God's way, He'll refresh us. As we allow God to guide us, He refreshes us on the journey. This journey we're taking, we find refreshment in. Trusting the Lord to give us wisdom has a positive effect on our physical well-being. Did you know that? You're physically, when you don't trust God at His Word, when you're always worrying and you're always anxious, it, it'll have a toll on you physically. And there's just a great way to live. A great way to live is trusting the Lord. And not being wise in our own eyes, but saying, God, we have no idea what to do, but you do. And I acknowledge that you are God. And I acknowledge that you can see down the road a whole lot farther than I can. I cannot tell you how many times I've had this discussion with God since March. I've been upset, frustrated like you have, wondering what's going to become of the church, what's going to become of the nation, what's going to become of each one of us, where we're headed, what's going on. And we're just a few days away from, from who knows what. So I can tell you this, nothing will happen that God has not already seen. And this is putting that into practice. That tonight we say no matter what happens, we are going to trust in the Lord with all of our hearts. And we're not going to lean on our understanding because, guys, we are not going to understand. We don't understand it tonight. Many of us have lived long enough to say, I cannot believe some of the stuff I am hearing with my own ears right now. I cannot believe it. I cannot believe that adults are sitting down and questioning a, a, a hopeful Supreme Court justice with some of the stuff they've been laying on this woman. And we all sit back and we say, how could adults talk to adults like that? We don't understand. But God's seen it coming. God saw down the road. He knows how it's all going to turn out. And the truth be known, we can't figure it out because we're not that wise. How much of this whole thing you got figured out anyway? If we were that wise, we'd have cured COVID already. Don't you think the world's best are on it? Sometimes things happen that stump us. If we were so wise, why can't we stop a hurricane? Why can't we divert a storm? Why can't we make a tornado go away and go outside? And we think we're big. We think we're something. Selfish pride says, look what I've accomplished. But you go out in a windstorm and hold your hands up and say, stop, and see if it stops. But God can. And that's who we lean on. 
And it says it'll be healthy to us to do that. You'll just have a better physical well-being. I'm preaching to myself right now. (laughs) I'll feel better. I'll do better when I worry less and trust more. And then verses 9 and 10, and we'll be done. We won't get through every single little thing, but I thought this was good. Honor the Lord with your substance. And with the first fruits of thine all thine increase. And you're saying, ah, we knew he wouldn't stop before he got to the giving part. Well, that might be true on a Sunday morning. This is Wednesday night, so Bible students, you know, I, I believe a lot of you are honoring God. What did it mean to honor God with your substance? It's not just your money. But to honor God means to affirm the importance of His presence among us. Listen, this is the honest truth. One of the most worshipful moments of any service ought to be in our giving time. Because we wouldn't have it to give if He'd not given it to us. And the biblical principle in Solomon's day was it wasn't as much finances as it was this. They grew crops. And you know growing crops, it don't grow unless the sun shines and the rain falls. Unless the wind, you don't want it to come through and tear down those cornfields all of a sudden. So here's the thing. That substance, what they realized, if I have a bumper crop, it's because God gave it to me. Listen, tonight it'd do us all good to stop for just a minute and realize everything we have, God gave it to us. Our babies, our homes, this building, our eyesight, our legs, our health, whatever we have. If you go home tonight and there's something to pull out of that cabinet, praise God for that. And so what they would do, listen, it's called first fruits. It's what what Solomon says. So if they grew 10 fields, the first crop that came in, they gave to God. Not the fifth crop. I'm going to see if I've got enough to put in the barn and then, then, you know, I'll, I'll give a little after that. People often come up to me and they'll ask this question. Do you give before taxes or after? Do you give before or after? First fruits is before. That's the biblical principle. Because the biblical principle teaches us you give him the first crop. You say, God, because you've given us more than we could ever imagine. We've had a bumper crop, and that's by your hand. This first crop is given to you. And then watch what God does. Verse 10, your barns will be filled with plenty. You can trust God that if you do right by God, he will do right by you. It's just the way it works. Giving him the honor he deserves, whether we like it or not, means that we give him a portion of the wealth we have accumulated. First fruits. Solomon directs his son to understand that honoring the Lord with the harvest would not be a wasted effort. There's wisdom in that. I tell you what, if we'd set our children down and we teach them biblical giving, they'll be blessed because of it. It'll bless them. When you teach them, this is the way to do it. It's God's. It belongs to God. You give God the first fruits. Because if you don't give Him what is His, then you are essentially stealing. You are keeping God's stuff. And after all, if you had ten crops, it's not like God said, give me five of them. He said, give me that tenth. The notion that uh, sometimes it, you know, I realize it's it's up to each individual. I I see it that way. First fruits means to me first fruits. These people made their living by farming, and they understood the fruit giving. Well, if you want to finish your lesson, Proverbs three eleven and twelve. Here's here's some. We'll read these two verses together, my son. He goes on to teach his son, 
Despise not the chastening of the Lord. Neither be weary of His correction. Anybody in here been corrected? God ever had to straighten you out? For whom the Lord loveth, He correcteth. Even as the Father, even as a Father, the Son in whom He delights. God intends for us to be disciplined Christians because He wants us to win the battle, guys. He wants us to win these battles. We have spiritual warfare. It's a real deal. And listen, if the Lord loves you, He'll correct you. If He didn't love us, He wouldn't care if we win or lose. So remember that about your father tonight. He loves you enough to not just let you do whatever you want to do. He'll take you to the woodshed. He'll reprove us. He'll say, this has got to happen, and it's because I love you. And the writer, it's in big blue letters. When we think about what's happening to us, we do well to start with the unshakable certainty of God's love. I can't help but think tonight that what's happening to us as a nation is proof of God's love. He's been so merciful. By the way, if God tonight got even stiffer and started punishing us more, we deserve it. But He's been mercy-filled. He's been long-suffering. He has dealt with us generously. The fact of it tonight is that we even get to be here as a generous gift from God. But I can see a God saying to His church tonight, I love you too much to just let you keep going like you were going. I want you to wake up in the closing hours of history. I want you to wake up before I step out on the clouds. I need you all to wake up and get your priorities right. It's not about your building and your bank accounts. It's about lost souls. It's about putting me as first in the church. It's about making me who I'm supposed to be. God is, is wisely as a father taking us and saying, it's not about your stuff. You walked around with, with, with doctors and hospitals and medicine. Now there's an unseen virus that we can't, we can't come to grips with and it's, it's taking, doing things we can't even understand. And God yet in His tender love is a father saying, if I didn't love you, I wouldn't even allow it to happen. I wouldn't care how you live. I wouldn't care if you just burn up under your own misery. But I love you enough to show you a warning sign and to say to you, wake up. Wake up and come back to me for you've left your first love. You've gone your own way. And may the church return whatever it is and whatever it looks like in the months to come. That's dependent upon each individual to make that choice. But when we come through, may we come through saying we do not come to play games at the foot of the cross. We have not come in here to just idly sit through this. We have come to recognize the one Isaiah saw. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. He is the one worthy of our worship and worthy of our praise, worthy of our adoration. I said this the other day in our Bible study. and I, The other day I was close to a child and that child started crying. Just couldn't get its breath. This little innocent child was just being torn in a decision. And I was watching the whole thing unfold. This little innocent child just crying, sucking in breath. And the Holy Spirit of God said to me, Can you imagine what hell sounds like? But the Bible says there's a real place where there's weeping and wailing and the gnashing of teeth. That's what the Bible says about hell. For far too long, each one of us has gotten so comfortable in church life, have we missed the lost in the process? 
Have we gotten so wrapped up in us that we're missing them? The fields are ripe. We've been given the great commission. You can't improve on it. God said, go ye therefore. And he's fixing to come and gather the harvest. And he said, oh, by the way, the laborers will be few. So we ought not be shocked that there's not many who want to labor. But the rewards are out of this world. Father, we love you tonight and thank you for your word and what it teaches us. And we need your wisdom and we need your guidance. And may we embed it in our hearts and let it live out in our lives. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, thanks for being with us in worship today. It is our heart's desire that through the word and through this worship service today, God has spoken to your heart and you desire to serve him and to worship him more than you ever have in your life. You know, if you've been watching today and you don't have a relationship with Jesus Christ, that is our greatest desire. If we can be a help to you, if we can uh, assist you in any way, please contact us at the information you see on the screen. We also want to thank those of you who watch us regularly. We greatly appreciate your prayer and support. Keep praying for us as we pray for you as we serve the Lord together. <laughs>